John chapter 5 and verse 2. John chapter 5 and verse 2. Now, there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. The number five symbolizes God's greatness. You can be seated. Thank you for standing. Symbolizes God's grace, God's goodness, and his favor towards humanity. The house of Bethesda was known as the house of mercy. The place was that place where God had yielded and given promises in the past, even though they were infrequent and maybe though the timing was uncertain, God had come through before and people would wait, the Bible tells us, for a moving, for a stirring of the water. That there was a season where God would come down and he would allow an angel to minister and to move that water and his presence and his power would touch somebody and an individual would leave healed. The Bible goes on to tell us that, that in this New Testament passage, John senses a responsibility to relate to us the fact that this place had five porches. And in these lay a great multitude of impotent folk. The weak were there, of blind, those that had their sight lost. They were the halt, the, the lame, and the withered, the individuals that were just kind of waiting for life to end for them. But there in that place, there was a little bit of hope. The Bible goes on to tell us that they were waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season, everyone say season, into the pool and troubled the water. And whosoever was there first after the troubling of the water stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And so we're given the setting, we're given the introduction to the story. It was this feast that Jesus and the disciples had come to and, and, uh, and now they were here in this pool of Bethesda, the place of five porches. And, and in the environment, there was a great deal of people that were filled with certain impossible situations. And then the Bible zeroes in for a moment on an individual. It said, a certain man was there which had an infirmity 30 and 8 years. I was over there this morning trying to remember 38 years ago. Where was I 38 years ago? I know that maybe it was March break 38 years ago. I was somewhere between grade 8 and grade 9. And, and I remember my junior high school, Rossi Junior High. I remember the teacher that we had. I remember that after a few years, it was the first time that my sister and I were back together in the same class. And so we always had stories to tell and circumstances that were happening. And the same homework, which is always a blessing. Thirty-eight years ago was a long time ago. Can anybody remember where you were 38 years ago? I mean, 38 years is a season of time. 38 years is three decades, almost four decades. 38 years is a time for generations to move on and new generations to come up. There was a man that was there for 38 years. Just let that sink in for a second. For 38 years. 38 years of going through the same motion, 38 years of waiting, 38 years of promises yet to be fulfilled. There he was. There he was waiting. He had an infirmity, and when Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? That place was the place where society decided that they would leave the people they couldn't help any longer. It was the people that no hospital could fix. It was the individuals that no doctor could heal. It was the place where no therapy could work. That was the place where they left these people. And this man was perhaps there the longest. We don't know, but 38 years he had sat at this porch. He's watched political leaders come and go. He's seen kings coronated and cremated. He's watched religious leaders come onto the scene and then leave the scene. There's been high priests and zealots. There's been prophets and preachers and teachers. He's, he's sat there in that place now for 38 years. 
He's counted the attendees at the poolside. He's calculated the time left in the day by the way the shadows cast themselves across the pool. There's the spring and the summer. There's the fall and the winter. And, and every day he has been privileged for someone to bring him to this place. He's heard the haggling of the buyers and sellers at the sheep market that's right next door. He's heard the bleeding of the sheep and the commotion that comes in that commerce. And it all becomes so normal and normative to him. After 38 years, after 38 years, you fall into routine. And, and I would even say that after 38 years, you fall into ritual. He seemed to remember why he had come in the first place, although he had to remind himself of it. He, he had come for him originally. He, he'd come in the past. He'd come because at first he believed there would be a miracle. He had come with hope. He, he had come with faith. He, he had come believing that maybe this day, today, that day would have been, could have been the day when everything changed. But as each day passed and each hour that passed that could have been the hour went by, it's something about hope that just seems to slip away. Each moment his attention could have been or would have been riveted on the pool earlier, was that a ripple or was it just a breeze? Was it, was it somebody just kind of kicking their foot in the side of the pool or was that really just a moving of the water? Is this the moment that I've been waiting for? Is this the season that I've been waiting on? But after 38 years, you know, there was friends that were still there with him. His, his friend that was blind was still over there on the left and his friend that was deaf was still over there on the right. The, the crippled man that had been along with him for the past decade was still there on the side of the pool in his bed, you know. And they're all kind of friends there except for when the water stirs, then it would become every man for himself. And so now, in this moment, with this man standing before him asking him, will he be made whole? I'm sure that his answer was, I... I don't know. I don't know because here's my predicament. The impotent man, the powerless man answered him and said, Sir, I have no man. When the pool is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. I've got nobody. I don't know if somebody in the room, you've come today and somewhere beneath the surface you echo with the statement that was made by this man. I've got Nobody. I've got nobody that knows the real story. I've got nobody that knows the broken part of me. I've got nobody that understands. Nobody that knows the crippled part of me that can't get up. It's been a while now. It's been a season that I've been here. I, I don't know if I can get through this. I don't know if I can get over it. I, I've been broken for a long time, but nobody has been able to help me before. Nobody's been able to, to make this work. Nobody's been able to, to break me free of the prison that I've been in. Nobody's been able to release me from the bondage that's held me. Nobody has been able to help me. I've got nobody. I, I don't know if somebody's here in the room, but we live in a, in a society that is filled with people, yet people are lonely. We've got people that go through their day, through their week, through their moments, and if they could echo anything from this story, they would say that they have nobody. They understand that man. They understand the impossibility that comes when you feel like you've got nobody to help, when you're doing this on your own. Oh, somebody dropped me off. They, they went through the motions long enough, but, but here I am back in the same place. And it's easy to play the comparison game. And, and uh, he begins to relay the story. I've got nobody. I, I've got nobody. There are people here that have somebody. But I've got nobody. I'm, I'm just here by myself. I've got no way to get to the pool. And, and then the reality of his impossibility seems to settle in on us, doesn't it? Because if he's got nobody to help him, then why would you bother going anyway? Why would you show up day after day, knowing that you couldn't get free, knowing that you couldn't get to the pool, knowing that somebody there is going to be quicker than you. So if the water gets stirred and if the water begins to be moved and if the angel does show up, I'm still not going to be the one that gets freedom today. But yet the man still came. Here he, he shows up day after day, and, and maybe at first he was hoping for the miracle, but now it's just turned into ritual. You see, we can look at this story and we can criticize him maybe, or, or we can sympathize with him probably. 
But the reality is, is that Scripture is very direct and meets us where we are because we all can become that man. We can begin to live life going through the motions and we come with the right intention and we come with the right desire. We show up at first, maybe it's been five years ago or ten years ago or maybe it's been uh, you know, a couple decades ago, but, but, but at first it's, 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 we're passionate and we're desirous to see the thing change and, and we're hoping that something transitions and, and, and a miracle is transferred to us and we receive everything that we hope for. We're hopeful. But after a while, it's easy for that hope to slip away. And now this man is left in that game where he is comparing himself to everybody around him. The comparison game can happen after 38 years. It can happen after 38 weeks. It can happen after 38 days. Comparing ourselves amongst ourselves can happen after 38 hours. I mean, it can happen in 38 seconds. Can it? They say a bear, black bear, when they approach an enemy or something that could be harmful or when they're preparing for conflict, in those moments of conflict, they will stand up on their hind legs and it's not to see better, they don't see well, it's not to test their footing, that's not the purpose, but the whole reason that they'll stand up is so that they can compare themselves against the opponent that they're facing. How do I measure up to them? And it's so easy that we do the same thing in our lives, that we can, we can begin to measure ourselves by the others in our life. And this man was doing that. Maybe in the past he had people, but after 30 years, somewhere along the line, people got tired. First, they, they were going through the right actions, and, and somewhere along the line, they just began dropping them off. And they knew that it was impossible. Somewhere hope slipped out of the story, and the dream died. Somewhere his vision just leaked away and passion passed off the scene. He, he no longer was there for the reason he had initially started coming. Now he was there because it was just the ritual. The same pool, the same sickness, the same stories, the same people over and over again, but occasionally something miraculous would happen. The ritual had become his reality. You see, John had mentioned that there were five porches and then he categorizes people into four groups. He said the powerless, the lame, the blind, and the withered. There are five porches and four categories that he named, but I think after a while we could name the other category. And it was probably where this man sat. It was the porch of the impossible. The porch of the impossible held those people that no longer felt they could receive what they had initially began coming for. The porch of the impossible were the people that, that recognized the reality of where they were. And they didn't know how to change. They didn't know how to do anything different. I mean, after 38 years, 38 years of coming to the same location, 38 years of hoping for the same promise, now that's all leaked away and you just begin to go through the motions. You see... Here the, he was in the same pool with the same sickness, the same story. And if you're not careful, you could say the same season. But that is where we would be wrong. And what that man didn't realize was that the season was about to change. And we know we're in the changing of a season right now and Everybody that feels like you're thankful for spring coming just a little early would just shout amen. amen. Now maybe you got a snowmobile at home or maybe you got a big snowblower you really want to give it a workout this year. I don't know. I'm not that guy. That may be you. However, I'm a little grateful for an early changing of the season. You see, what we know is that the environment doesn't determine the season. The season determines the environment. I'll say it again. The environment doesn't determine the season. 
The season determines the environment. You see, as the season shifts a little early, the environment begins to adapt to the season that's changing. That's why the snow is melting off your driveway. That, that's why when you stepped off your step this morning after maybe a month or two of ice that had been there, now it's just a little puddle. Maybe now when, when you look out what had been just some white permafrost on your front lawn, it looks like there was a lawn under there all along. You see, because the season begins to determine the environment. Our environment is shifting because the season is changing. And what this man didn't know is that he felt like his season was forever locked in. That it was an impossibility that he would ever receive his miracle. But the season was about to change for him. They had identified a certain season that would come when an angel would move and the waters would be stirred. And someone that stepped into the pool, their life would be changed but now what this man doesn't realize is that his season is about to change because the one who is standing before him is the maker of all of the seasons and he determines what happens and when it happens and I just came to remind someone today that there is one greater in control that determines when your season changes he's the one that says there's something that's going to happen maybe you felt like it was an impossibility but today God is turning it into possibility because he is the season changer today. He changes the season. We're talking about the one, come on, that flung the galaxies into place. We're talking about the one that set the stars where they are. We're talking about the one that set the sun where it is and placed the earth in orbit around it and gave it a little spin and put, come on, put us into motion so we see different seasons, spring and summer, fall and winter. And now that one was standing before the crippled saying, wilt thou be made whole he just needed a reality check that the maker of all the seasons was at work in his situation and I came to remind someone today it may have been an impossibility until now but God is changing the season you may be just going through the rituals and you're caught up in the moments of the past but God is about to do a work of restoration in somebody's life it's about to change because the season changer stepped in the room the porch of impossibility can't hold you any longer the porch of impossibility won't define who you are anymore the porch of impossibility is where you sat all this time but God is saying I'm about to take the impossibility and make it possible I'm about to take the circumstance and turn it around I am the God of the miracle I'm telling you that season changer is in the room it was 22 years ago, November the 3rd, 2002. It was a Sunday night in our church. Brother Lyndon Shalom was here. Brother and sister Alan Shalom were here. The choir was singing. We were under some spiritual attack in our church. Anyone know spiritual forces are real? We were under some spiritual attack at CCC. But it was in the middle of the song, Brother Alan Shalom came up. And he grabbed the microphone and he began to pray in the spirit. Because sometimes you confront the spiritual attack with spiritual confrontation. When we pray in the spirit, it's because we're warring on another level. When we begin to pray in the spirit, it's because we're tackling something in a different dimension. It's because there's a season adjustment that needs to be made. And we've got the right to allow the season changer to change the circumstance. It can change the environment of the room. And, and he grabbed the mic and he began to pray. And in the middle of what we were facing, in the middle of what are hurting, in the middle of the impossibility that we were facing at that time, God began to change some things. We could take you back literally to, to some of those times that, that God took impossibilities and began to turn them for purpose and good. We began to receive the promise that God had for us. But here's what I'd like to remind us is that we can, cannot just look back to the old seasons of change. We can't just rest in those and, and because seasons, we cycle through them. 
And so that was a past season for then. But I'd like to remind someone that there is a new season for now. That God is at work and he's preparing us because we, we can go through, and I, I'm not criticizing ritual. Ritual's powerful. There's power in, in system. There's power in routine. There's power in continuing even when it doesn't feel like it's the right thing to do. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? There, there's power in, in showing up even when you didn't feel like it. There's, there's power in worshiping when you don't feel like it. There, there's power in praying when you don't feel like it. There, there's power. Our feelings can't determine everything that we do. Sometimes we just get to get to in the routine. And, and then in the midst of the routine is where God steps in. And that's where he's going to move. Routine is powerful. I, I'm not saying that it isn't powerful, but I'm saying sometimes we can get locked into the ritual and we can miss the moment where God is beginning to turn the season. And man, I feel hope rising in my spirit right now. We are stepping into a new season. The pool still looks the same. That lame man could have looked at the pool and said it still looks the same. The church may look the same. We may still have the same people with the same hang-ups hanging out. But God is about to turn the season. God's about to turn it around. We don't see any drastic difference on the outside. The, the seats still look the same. The people still look the same. But something is changing. There is an adjustment that is happening in the supernatural realm. And God is preparing to do something powerful in our midst. You see, we've got ritual. We've, we were talking about that. But the danger in ritual is that we lose expectation. The danger with ritual is that we come day after day and minute after minute and we go through the same motions. And so after a while, our anticipation of what God could do or what God will do gets lost in our ritual because we're just going through the same motions, going through the same activity and, and going through the, you know, I, I, I noticed the other day I, I was doing some walking at the church and I always walk in a counterclockwise motion here. And finally, I said, I wonder what it would be like to walk the other way. <laughs> These are real thoughts <laughs> that I have. And I began to walk the other way. And I thought, wow, this is a whole new perspective. Someone say wow with me. Come on, someone say it backwards. <laughs> Just seeing if you're here. And I always walk this way, but all of a sudden I was like, you know what? Let's walk this way. And all of a sudden now I could see things that I couldn't see before. Seriously, because when I would walk the other way, when I went by the windows out there, this whole section was back here. Now when I walked this way, I, I got to see a new perspective. Uh, just a little simple illustration to say sometimes that, that we can come to the same place, but God's saying, we're just going to do things a little differently. That's why he asked the man, wilt thou be made whole? And he began to give him all the excuses about why something good couldn't happen, about why something else wasn't going to change, about, about I've, I've been here 38 years, and I, this is my bed, this is my spot, and, and we've got, come on, we, we've got the, <clears throat> the people that are, that are impotent over here, and we've got the halt, and we've got the lame, and we've got the blind, and then there's my spot. That's the, the porch of impossibility. And this is the place that, that I sit. And this is the place where I stay. And this, I've been here 38 years, so I've got, I've got some seniority around here. So I get to sit where I want to sit. People know this is my spot and this is my place. I'm not, I'm, I don't think I'm speaking about anybody sitting in chairs. But I'm just saying that sometimes if we're not careful, we can get locked into the history and the routine. And we can begin to say, you know what? It's impossible for anything different. I, I hear them. And, and, and you see what happens with the impotent man. After a while, he comes and, and, and his excitement is based on something else happening for somebody else. And he begins to observe the miracles that somebody else receives. And, and he begins to see the baptisms that happen in someone else's family. And, and he begins to see the Holy Ghost has poured out in somebody else's life. And he begins to see deliverance that happens in somebody else's spirit in, in the altar. And, and if he's not careful, he can begin to base his entire purpose and existence on somebody else's experience when God is standing before him saying, Wilt thou be made whole? God is going to make 
make this personal this morning. He's not going to allow us just to observe what's happening in somebody else's life. God is asking you this morning, will thou be made whole? Are you going to allow God to do something special, spectacular, miraculous in your life? Because if we're not careful, ritual can lock us in. But when we begin to release expectation... When expectation rises in our spirit, all of a sudden it's God's going to do something for me. I, I'm grateful for what God is going to do collectively in this room. I'm grateful that we're going to see, come on, miracles, signs, and wonders because that's what happens. But that, that, that those signs follows, follow believers. But, but I'm excited about what God's going to do in my life. And you've got to be willing to say that about yourself. Ritual versus expectation. Let me give you an example of expectation. We've, we've had preachers here and the crowds come. But the amazing thing is that before the preacher ever preaches, the miracles begin to happen. So you can't say it's the preacher. It's the people with the expectation. We've had some powerful people grace this pulpit. I'm grateful for every one of them. We're just coming off of February, and, and if we're not careful, we can begin to base our expectation on who's here or when somebody's here or what's coming down the pipe. But God's saying, get ready because I'm doing something right now. Will you be made whole? Come on, son. somebody's getting it this morning. God wants to do something in my family. God wants to do something in my life. God, God wants to do something right, right here. Will, will you? Will you let God do the miraculous? Will, will you let God do something powerful for you? Will, will you? Will thou be made whole? Will you this morning? Before the preacher even preaches, we've had people receive the Holy Ghost and healings and deliverance. And, and if we're not careful, ritual will rob us of our expectation. But if you can raise your level of expectation, God will do that work he promised he would do. Someone say restoration. Will thou be made whole? We can come back to the music this morning. The Bible tells us that the season is going to change. The minor prophet Habakkuk ended his book with these words. Chapter 3, verse 17, he said, although the fig tree shall not blossom. That doesn't sound very hopeful. Neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail. And the fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold. These are dire straits right here. There shall be no herd in the stalls. He said, although, though. He said, although. This is going to happen. Don't define what I'm going to do based on what you see. Don't define what's going to happen based on your observation. Don't let ritual, because ritual would say that nothing good can come of this. But that's why Jesus stood before him and said, Wilt thou be made whole? Because he was about to change the season that that man was in. When the outlook is defined by impossibility, this is what the Christian has to remember. God's not finished working. And even though all that was happening, Habakkuk said in verse 18, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. He defined him as the God of salvation in the midst of everything wrong that was happening in his world. Even though all those things were happening, the stalls were empty, the folds were empty, the, come on, the, the fields were empty. But it didn't matter because God was still working in the middle of all the impossibility. The maker of the seasons is on our side. And his goal it's our theme this year is to restore what we've been lacking, what's been lost. It's verse 8 that tells us the remainder of the story. Jesus said to that man, rise, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed 
and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. I wonder if you'd stand together with me this morning. You see, God's been just walking us into this place of the miraculous. It was during Remnant when Brother Chris Green was here, he began to talk about that miracle. Of... And then, is it coincidence that that night someone shows up in a wheelchair to be prayed for? Now, I don't know all the circumstances around the story yet, and that's not, that's not just me trying to avoid the story and the certainty of it, but here's what I do know is that he rolled in in a wheelchair but walked out. And he, here's, here's what I like to say is that is that something is shifting in the environment. And I feel the Holy Ghost right now. And God's, God's challenging us because some things are going to change and we're going to see some things we've never seen before. So we've got to prepare for it. Come on, Brother McNair, you, you texted it to our group, Fred. Miracles, they're going to happen. Fire. The miraculous is going to occur somewhere. So, Lord, see a group of people this morning that would say, let it happen here. The supernatural is more important than the natural, but God is going to allow us to see some things in the natural so we can know what he's doing in the supernatural. But there's people that have come in the room this morning and I had a heavy burden. As a matter of fact, I had intended on going in a very different direction, but the Spirit of the Lord challenged me to preach this to us this morning. Because somebody would be in the room that you don't know how to move forward from here. It may be your first time. It may be your 38th year. I don't know. But here's what I know is that God wants you to leave different than the way that you came. And when that man walked out that day with his bed in his hand, he knew two things. He knew that he was healed and he knew that he wasn't alone. He knew that there was somebody on his side. He, he knew that he didn't, come on, he wasn't going through life alone. That God knew where he was. That God met him in that moment. That God could heal. The maker of the seasons was mir- working miracles in his life. And, and I believe with all of my heart that God would desire to do that for somebody in the room this morning. And, and we're pretty good. Come on, we're Pentecostals. We're pretty good at putting people in all different kinds of categories. And we've got the five porches all outlined for everybody that's here in the room this morning but but i just like someone to know that whatever the problem is in your life there's a porch here that god has for you you may fall in any one of the four categories that john named but you may also be in that fifth porch saying it's impossible pastor jack i don't know how god's gonna do it from here i do he is the miracle worker and everything doesn't happen, have to happen the way that it's always happened for God to do what he's going to do. God is about to release healing. Woo. God is about to release the miraculous. God is about to lift somebody out of impossibility. God is about to pour out his spirit. God is about to do the miracle. Come on, God is about to do it. He's about to do it. Your bed of affliction can't hold you any longer. Take up your bed and walk. It's time. It's all right for someone to come to the altar this morning. It's open right now. I I, I wish that everybody, we don't have to know the the circumstance. But the altar's open this morning because the miracle worker is working miracles right now. There's a moving in the supernatural that God is doing here. It may have just been ritual until now, but God's about to turn it into restoration. It may have just been ritual until this moment, but God's about to restore something that's been lost, something that's been broken, something that's been missing in your life. God is going to do it this morning. Come 
on, prayer warriors. Begin to pray in the spirit for a minute. Be glad then, scripture said, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. Why? Because, come on, he's going to let give us the former rain moderately. He's going to cause to come down for you the rain, the former and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the fat shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar, all 38 years that were lost, God can bring back. All the moments that you miss, God's about to do a work of restoration if you'll let Him. I don't know what's missing in your life right now, but God's doing a work of restoration. I don't know what you lost, but God's willing to bring it back. I don't know what's broken right now, but God's about to heal. I don't know, come on, I don't know what path you've been walking on, but God's about to turn it around. I wish every person would pray with expectation for a moment this morning. Restore God. Restore. Restore everything you promised that you would. Restore joy. Restore it to be the joy of my salvation. Restore God. Restore peace. God, restore the gift of your spirit. Restore it in somebody's life. 